thick and sluggish. Now that's your that's your sewage system. So that's kind of like you turn on the faucets in your house and everything's good, but the water doesn't really go down the drain too good, right? The, the circulatory system's working, fluids coming through, but then like the drain and the, the toilet's kind of backing up, and the the drain and the the tub is kind of like filling up, right? It like takes a couple minutes after you shut the shower off for the water to go down. That's kind of like what's happening in the lymphatic system. The fluids are building up, but we keep putting in more and more, and it starts building up, and now the lymph nodes are swollen, and it's like, you know, every day the women are feeling like, oh my God, I don't even know what breast cancer looks like, but I know it's everywhere, and everyone's getting affected by it. I, oh my God, a lump! And then they go to the doctor, and the doctor says, we're going to have to cut these lymph nodes out. You don't even maybe really know what lymph nodes are, but it's like, just take them! and more of the lymphatic system. The sewage system gets cut out, which means then, how good is the sewage treatment plan? Well, probably not that good, right? See how this cycle starts working? So, important to understand that the lymphatic organs are there to treat sewage. And the best way to keep your lymph clean is A, eat clean fats. Obvious. Good, clean fats. What are clean fats? Clean fats are things like um, what's in whole plant foods. What's in cold pressed oils, like good olive oil or good coconut oil, not the cheap stuff, the good stuff, real food. The fat that's in good quality, well-raised animals, not the kind that are raised on corn. Because basically, if your cow is raised on corn, you're eating corn oil, right? That's just obvious. But animals that eat grasses, animals that eat natural foods, the dairy products from animals that eat natural foods, those are good fats, and those build you up, and they keep you clean, and they keep you healthy. Those real liquidy fats, like what's in fishes and cold water fishes, those are good fats. You start putting in things like corn oil, canola oil. You guys all know canola oil means Canadian oil. That's a trade name for rapeseed oil. Canola is, a, a, is literally a trade name, like Q-tip, right? <laughs> it's, just a, it's just a brand name. Um, vegetable oil, which is another way of saying soy oil, right? When you start eating those things, they start clogging up. Another key thing about fat, a lot of substances in the planet are fat-soluble or they dissolve into fat. And that means that stuff gets into fat, and when you eat it, it dissolves into your fat. So, key, key thing to understand, what is vegetable oil? Is that like the, the oil out of carrots? <laughs> oil out of lettuce? Well, what is vegetable oil? It's soy, right? It's another word for soy oil. Right, you go to the store and you see like peanut oil, olive oil, safflower oil, but you don't see soy oil, right? We see vegetable oil, but that's soy oil, right? Let's all just anchor that idea about the lymphatic system because we're going to come back to that. And let's bring in another idea here real quick. Huge epidemic on the planet is um, something we call estrogen pollution. And that's something that is, I've been trying to bring that information more and more. And there's a few other researchers out there really trying to bring that information, but it's not really breaking into the mainstream yet. And it's a big, big story. This is what estrogen pollution is. Lots of the petrochemicals we've developed are estrogen-like in nature. And they're saturating the environment because they are pesticides and herbicides and plastics. Those things are estrogen-like. So estrogen-like that they're biologically active to your estrogen receptors in your body. And men and women both have estrogen receptors. Places in the body set up, lock and key system, the estrogen fits into a receptor site like a lock fits into a key. Key fits into a lock. Right? If you take substances that are like estrogen, and you start introducing them into the body, like pesticides and herbicides and fungicides and synthetic chemicals and petrochemicals and plastics that get into our food, blah, 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 they start to act like estrogen to the point that we become saturated with estrogen. And what happens? We see men have sperm counts driven to the lowest they've ever been with right now. We see men developing breast tissue or becoming hyperfeminized. We see women developing very difficult to get rid of body fat in places like the breast, the hips, and the butt. We see lots of moodiness, lots of mood swings, and we see cancers developing in the prostate, the testicles, the ovaries, the uterus, the cervix, the breasts, and thyroid tumors, as well as other endocrine system and sexual system based problems. Estrogen is not bad, but estrogen is meant to exist in a balance. And xenoestrogen, which is toxic estrogens that are come from external places, synthetic estrogens, or phytoestrogens, which are plant-based estrogen-like compounds, in excess will drive the body towards endocrine system breakdown and 
tumors and things like fibroids. For instance, if you take a plant that has a lot of estrogen in it, like the black bean, and you feed a culture on the black bean, like what's happening right now, and is new, by the way, this is an ancient, this is new, but that's what happens in Mesoamerica, or say the Puerto Ricans, for instance, living on a diet of black bean, what you get is a situation where you can almost guarantee just about every woman in her life there is going to develop fibroid tumors. It's a given. Now what you're going to end up with is doctors who go, hey, this is, this is a genetic problem for these people. Well, it's not a genetic problem for those people. It's a dietary problem. The biggest estrogen in our food supply right now is soy. And you guys are probably starting to hear about that. Like, for instance, one glass of soy milk is like the equivalent of four to six birth control pills. When you do the math on a, um, on a baby soy formula, and you do the math for body weight, it comes out to one, one bottle of soy-based baby formula is the equivalent of, um, I think, eight birth control pills for a baby. So you end up with hyperfeminized bodies that are basically sterile, like today, and um, not only do they have poorly developed secondary sex characteristics, but they develop later on things like breast cancer. So we want to start moving away from those foods that are full of estrogen, like soy, like flax, like black bean. We want to move away from those foods. We want to get away from things like herbicides, pesticides, fungicides, larvicides, plastic containers for our food, plastic containers for our water, putting plastic food containers in the microwave and heating it up so the plastic leaches into the food. We want to get away from that stuff, milk in containers right, of plastic, fatty milk that absorbs the fats, absorb that plastic, right? Because it's, it's fat soluble, so it sucks into the milk, and then you drink the milk, and that, that goes through and, and lodges itself through the lymphatic system into the body fats and saturates us with estrogen. So by going to that just sensible diet that I was talking about before, and there are people in this room who can really tune you into that, it's not the scope of this lecture today, but going towards the traditional foods, good vegetables, good meats, good fishes, good dairy products, by going towards that, we eliminate all that stuff, all of a sudden that goes away. Then we're not on soy. Then we're not on being factory farmed. Then our fat's not loaded with estrogen. Then those estrogen receptor sites are free to pick up real estrogen from our endocrine system. And the breast cancer rates will go down, and the tumor rates will go down, the testicular issues will go down, the sperm counts will come up, secondary sex characteristics will come back, and we'll begin to become a strong race of people again. All the races will develop the strength again that's inherent in them and their reproductive strength. Does that make sense? That's kind of obvious. So what's happening is, we're living in a lifestyle that encourages the breakdown of our sexual systems, the breast just being one part of that. Encouraged, and then we're encouraged to feel guilty about it and pay money to, for the research on that. And then we're never told by the people promoting, those same people basically promoting the, the diet that causes it. And we don't know, we're in the dark about it. Okay, so that lymphatic system that we were talking about earlier, it doesn't have a pump, which means fluids have a difficult time moving through it. Especially if it's clogged up with all those dietary fats. Especially if people are sedentary, which means they're not moving. Keep in mind, this is just one type of movement, right? So some people are like, well, I walk. I bet there are people in this room right now who haven't done this in a year. That's, that, is it fair to say there's people who probably haven't done this in a year or more? Which means that there's movements that your body's capable of that you might not be doing. You might be into a kind of robot, robotic movement pattern where you just do the same movements all the time like a robot, and there's all these potential movements that are possible that would pump lymph out of areas that are stagnant that maybe you don't do. And then what happens is you get these little pockets of areas where it's like, oh, I'm kind of watery back here, I'm kind of flabby back here, what is it? What's all that lymph? It's not moving back there. I mean, you, know, you don't have the lymph problem in your wrist, say, because you move your wrist. Right? What happens to elderly people who don't walk anymore? The whole lower leg swells right up. And because they're always sitting, I'm lazy boy. The legs swell up. It just takes moving. It just takes moving. So areas of the body don't get moved. And the, the key thing to know about lymph is because there's no pump, there's nothing to like <coughs> open the vessels. Except movement. So if the vessels already don't really open that easily because they don't have a pump and they rely on movement, a little bit of pressure.